We are going to read from Ezekiel chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 14. I think what's a strange, strange, strange thing to start with, maybe, when you, when you read the title of the chapter or the little heading that's been put in to the NIV, but it, it'll make sense when we think about uh, later on in Ephesians chapter 5, how Christ treats the church. So we're going to read Ezekiel 16, verses 1 to 14. It says this, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says to Jerusalem. Your ancestry and your birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. No one looked on you with pity or had compassion enough to do any of these things for you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open field, for on the day you were born, you were despised. Then I passed by and saw you kicking about in your blood as you lay there in your blood. I said to you, live. I made you grow like a plant of the field. You grew and developed and entered puberty. Your breasts had formed on your hair had grown, you were, yet you were stark naked. Later I passed by, and when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed you, washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewellery. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck and I put a ring on your nose and earrings on your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. So you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothes were of fine linen and costly fabric and embroidered cloth. Your food was honey, olive oil and the finest flour. You became very beautiful and rose to be a queen. And your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty because the splendour I had given you made your beauty perfect declares the Sovereign Lord. Now you might look at that and still think, what a strange reading to begin a service with. And yet the picture there is of how God treats uh, the people of Israel, how God takes the people of Israel as his bride. And then we have a wonderful picture as we look forward to the fact that actually this is how we are treated as God's people by Christ. Christ rescues us when actually... We were sinners, despised, rejected, when we could do nothing for ourselves, when we were left on our own. And he came and said, live. And he came and he has washed us with his blood. He has made us clean. He has made us beautiful. And if you want to then jump further forward again, you want to read Revelation, you can read in Revelation the picture of the glorious bride of Christ and the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the fact that all creation is heading towards a marriage feast. A marriage feast of Christ and his bride. Those who he has saved. Those who have been rescued from their sin and brought into his kingdom. And the reason we looked at that is because the passage before us in Ephesians 5 later on is a picture of marriage. Or it speaks of the roles of wives and husbands. It speaks of um, why marriage is important and what it is a pointer to. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. That's where we've made it to. Which is, uh, means we're, right, we're getting towards the end, really. Um, this is the end of chapter 5. One chapter to go. Plenty to get through in the last chapter too, but one chapter to go. Ephesians 5, we're going to read from verses 22 to 33. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her 
by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless in this same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies he who loves his wife loves himself after all no one ever hated their own body but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does his church for we are members of his body for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh this is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ in the church however each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband and we're going to say four things from the outset before we actually get into what the text says partly because I think some of these will be questions you might ask off the back of this but we don't really have time you could spend a whole load of time on each one of them but I'm going to say four things from the outset hopefully just as by means of kind of clarification and introduction the first is this that I'm aware that both sat in front of me and watching uh, live on YouTube this morning uh, there are people who are single there are people who are married there are people who are divorced and there are people who are divorced and remarried and so a passage there for a marriage can be a challenging thing not only to preach but a, a challenging thing to listen to a passage on marriage can be something that is very convicting a passage on marriage can be painful and a passage on marriage can be heartbreaking because for some there will be feelings of loss for others there will be memories of what might have been and for still others there will be unmet longings that we feel we've never got to and, and so as a church we have a strong conviction that preaching through books of the bible from beginning to end is the best way to teach god's people so it means we don't avoid hard subjects because i guess if it was down to me it'd be quite easy just to go right we'll just we'll not bother with chapter 5 verses 22 to 33 because it's going to be hard work but we're not doing that because it's part of Paul's letter to the Ephesians and we need to work through it but it also means that in a passage like this we can't cover everything so I'm well aware that in the half an hour or whatever it is I, I spend now seeking to teach you from these words in scripture I'm not going to be able to cover all the questions that might be in your head I'm also going to not going to be able to cover every set of circumstances that any individual might have faced or be facing um, as much as I'd love to be able to do that I can't and so my aim is to teach what the text says faithfully in its context and in its broader uh, biblical context and to give you more general application so that some of these things that we look at in this passage you can go away and talk through marriage is uh, a difficult thing because in a marriage two sinners are brought into an intimate lifelong relationship and so you see each other at your worst if you're married you see each other at your best as well but you see each other at your worst marriage is good though because God designed marriage he designed it for one man and one woman for life because the two become one new family joined together again by God's good gift of sex and so as a church what we should want whether we are like I say single married divorced divorced remarried widowed whatever whatever your current situation is what we should want is to have a church that has spiritually strong marriages that those who are married within church are in marriages that are strong that are gospel centered that are godly and so we all have a part to play in that wherever we currently stand that's the first thing the second thing is this the general idea of submission that runs through from verses 20 to uh, of chapter 5 to chapter 6 verse 9 is not an idea that is very popular in today's society in fact for the vast majority of the world it is despised it is ridiculed it is branded as outdated and as repressive because we live in an age of liberation now having said that as Christians liberation is something we should celebrate because after all in the gospel we are liberated right liberated from sin liberated from death 
And even in society, there are liberations that we should be keen to promote. Think about it. Women have been exploited badly in the past and are still exploited today. As much as we might not see it in some places, it still happens. Children have been ignored and suppressed, both in the past and today. Workers have been taken for a ride and given, not given their dues. And again, that still happens today. Christians should be at the forefront then of social change in those ways, at the forefront of exposing those things and then eradicating those things. Because after all, Jesus treated women with dignity and honour in a society that didn't treat women that way. Jesus welcomed children to himself, even when his own disciples wanted to keep them at arm's length. And Jesus came and washed the disciples' feet, modelling that true greatness was actually about service and not status. And so this point of submission that, that runs through here in Ephesians 5 and 6 doesn't contradict any of what Jesus did or said. Otherwise, we might as well get rid of the Bible because it's full of holes. That's the first two. The third one is this. I'm going to define for you two terms. Long words, you don't have to remember them, but you might hear them at some point in another context, and it's worth knowing what they mean. So there are two broad theological viewpoints when it comes to passages like this, uh, but particularly roles of men and women in marriage and in the church. And those two viewpoints are egalitarian on one side and complementarian on the other side. Again, don't worry about the words, just know that they're two different opinions with a range within each one. Uh, but roughly egalitarians would say men and women are equal in every way and there is no distinction. Everything is flattened out and those, any roles that there might have been basically don't exist, they're interchangeable. Very crudely put, okay? You could write reams on egalitarianism, but I've got three lines. Complementarianism, again, crudely put, is this. They would agree that men and women are equal, but they would say that there are distinct roles, that those roles are complementary. That's where that word comes from. There is equality, but difference. Uh, and that's where we'll stand today, or that's where I'm going to teach this passage from today. You can ask me more questions about that later. And fourth is this. And this out of the four things that we're talking about before we get into the text is the most important one, which is this. Really, this passage is all about the gospel. Really, this passage is all about Jesus, which shouldn't surprise us when we think about what's happened so far in four and a half chapters of Ephesians. See, Jesus in this passage is the model for wives and husbands. He is the model ultimately for all Christians, regardless of their marital status. Because actually, if you think about Jesus, and we sang earlier, your will be done, my God and Father. Jesus, the Son of God, submitted to his Father in heaven. And yet we would absolutely say there is no inequality between the Father and the Son, would we? And yet the Father and the Son have different roles. The Son isn't the Father, and the Father isn't the Son. And Jesus, again, the Son of God, came from heaven, gave up all of his rights to glory to become a man to give his life to die in our place so that we could enjoy knowing him for eternity he loved us so much that he was willing to put aside all of those things to sacrifice his life even unto death on a cross so that we could be saved and so actually jesus this is the one thing you remember from anything that is said this morning jesus is the model for you if you're a husband or a wife within marriage, and Jesus is the model for you ultimately if you're a Christian, whether you're married or not. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, and you're wondering, well, what's this got to do with me then? This is going to be a passage about marriage. I'm not a Christian and I'm not married. Why am I here? Well, because the gospel matters, because Jesus, the Son of God, as I've already said, came to serve and came to die for you. Even if you wanted nothing to do with him, which you didn't, and obviously at this point in time, as someone who hasn't trusted him, still don't. Even though you rejected him, even though you've taken all the good gifts, all the good things that you've enjoyed in life, you've taken and used and abused them, Jesus is willing to pay the price for your rebellion so that you can know him and enjoy heaven rather than be condemned to hell. He loved you so much that he was willing to endure torture and die a cruel and brutal death in your place. And he welcomes you with open arms if you'll come to him. Now, 
Now let's see in these verses that it is Jesus' actions, Jesus' attitudes, Jesus' very heart that drives what these verses say. So verse 22 to 24 are addressed to wives. And it starts with wives submit. And like I said, submission is not a word that we like. Imagine even now sat there, it's probably some of you bristling, go on the defensive, wives submit, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to submit. In fact, I'm ready to fight rather than submit. But the Bible doesn't shy away from it, so we've got to deal with it. Now, what is absolutely clear here is that this submission is voluntary and not enforced. This is not a picture of a wife having her will broken. And the submission doesn't imply inferiority in any way. It doesn't make the wife a doormat. The Bible is very clear. Go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 27. You find that God says, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So there is equality, right? Men and women created in the image of God. But then the letter to the Ephesians 2 has also made it very clear that there is equality in Christ. Because every human being who is saved and brought into God's family stands on an equal footing. Whether they are slave or free, whether they are male or female, whether they are Jew or Gentile. There is one new humanity. So this submission that Paul talks about here in verse 22 can't be and isn't about the wife being lesser in any way. This has to be about a difference in roles. And again, if you go back to the foundation in Genesis chapter 2, we find these words in Genesis 2, 18, and then 21 to 22. The Lord said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found amongst all the animals that he names. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, then closed up the place with flesh. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And to quote an old theologian, you might not like this picture, but I think it's quite helpful in many ways, whether this is the point of the passage or not, it's a helpful point to make. Matthew Henry says that the woman was made out of a rib of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm and to be protected, and near his heart and to be beloved. You see, there is equality, but difference. Equality made in God's image, equality made, being remade in the image of Christ as a Christian, but difference. Genesis 1 and 2 make that very clear. So wives submit is nothing to do with the value of the woman. And the rest of the verse helps with that, doesn't it? Wives submit to your own husbands. So it's submission to one man, not all men. And it's submission in a marriage relationship, not in all spheres of life. And it is as to the Lord. A wife submitting to her husband shows reverence for Christ. Go back to verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the same picture here. Wives, submit to your husbands out of reverence for Jesus because you love Jesus. And again, verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 1, 22, it described Christ as the head of the church, meaning that he is the leader or the ruler over the church because he's the head of the body. And again, this is where it is about roles. Within a marriage relationship, wives are to submit, submit to their husbands because their husband's role is to lead, to be the head. Now, we've got to be careful at this point. Because at this point, we read in all of our cultural stereotypes. But this doesn't say anything about them. It also shouldn't be used to establish them. These verses don't define what masculinity and femininity look like. So there's no mention of who does the DIY. There's no mention who does the cooking. There's no mention who looks after the finances. God doesn't tell us who should put the bins out. He doesn't tell us who should hoover the floor, clean the toilets or make the beds. It doesn't say that the wife is the delicate cooker, cleaner, crafter. 
It doesn't say that the husband is the dominant, competitive, alpha male DIY champion. It just doesn't say any of that anywhere in these verses. Those of us who are married have to work out what the practicalities of these differing roles look like in our house. Using the skills and abilities that God has given each of us and our spouse to serve each other best. These verses simply tell us that there are distinct roles overall in a marriage. Wives submit to their husbands who lead. We've also got to remember, as John Stott writes in his commentary on this, that Christ's headship of the church is described more like this. It's more about care than control and more about responsibility than rule. And so if that's the way he is head over the church, that is the way the husband is to be head in his marriage, which is also probably why Paul says about Christ being the saviour of the body as opposed to the lord of the body. His emphasis on is that caring responsibility. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord in everything. Again, let's be clear, this doesn't stifle the wife's acting. This doesn't stifle the wife's thinking. She doesn't become a robot who simply carries out her husband's every command. This shouldn't restrict women. It should free them. Because the submission that this is talking about should actually make her flourish. Her husband should be seeking to enable her to be the best that she can be, the best that God has made her to be. Husbands and wives together under one head, ultimately Jesus Christ, need to function together as a team, not as two individuals under the same roof. So wives are called to one of their husbands as spiritual heads, not to nag his heads. Wives are called to pray for their husbands. But husbands, if our wives aren't thriving and growing and flourishing, then we aren't leading well. Now, having said all this, our sinfulness kicks back against it, doesn't it? In lots of different ways. As a wife, chances are your sinfulness will want to undermine your husband's leadership or take over from him. And potentially say, well, I need to take over because he's a bad leader. As single people, you might be sat there thinking, well, what does this matter to me? Well, actually, if you are single and you are looking to get married, if you would like to get married and you're hoping that God might be leading you there, the question is, are you prepared to live out the roles that Paul describes will need to be lived out? Are you looking for the right thing in a husband? See, character rather than a chiseled jawline matters more. Attitude rather than abs should be what you're looking for. Don't head into a marriage thinking you're going to change the guy after you've tied the knot, because that's not the point or the purpose of it. If you're married, ask this question. Are there things you need to repent of? (coughs) Wives, are there ways you've hindered your husband leading well? Are you committing to praying for him? Husbands, have you allowed your sinful nature to actually go, oh yeah, Paul's instructions are brilliant, I'll just take advantage of these. Have you used them to excuse laziness or indulge in selfishness or allow yourself to be domineering? See, as a husband, I have to remember I am not Christ. I am to lead like Christ, but I am not Christ. So I cannot command and I do not deserve and should not expect unqualified obedience. That's not what Paul is saying here. Equally, if you're a single guy, where does this leave you? If you're a single guy preparing to be married, are you preparing yourself for what God calls you to be? How can you be working on Christ-like character now so that if or when God leads you to marriage, you're heading in the right direction? If you are married, is there laziness or selfishness or overbearing attitudes and actions that we need to confess, particularly guys? And how as men can we pray better for our wives? How how can we better work together to enable this submission to be what it should be, which is joyful rather than painful? And if divorce has been something in your past, 
Are these verses something you use to look back on and learn from? Rather than potentially looking back and being full of regret, are there things you can look back on and think, look, I need to repent of that or I've repented of that. I've learned from that. I'll now live differently because of that. That's why I submit to your husbands, 22 to 24. You might be sat there going, but Matt, there's loads more you could say. Yeah, there is loads more I could say, but we ain't got time, sadly. Verses 25 to 28. Here's where those of us who are husbands, all looking to be husbands, are going to get a healthy smack around the head with the gospel and then some medication from the gospel for the resulting headache. Look at the command to husbands. I think this is really important. Husbands love. Right, we'll stop there. Husbands love. Not husbands lead, not husbands rule. Husbands love. And it's repeated three times. Verse 25, verse 28, and verse 33. See, I think the reason husbands are told to love repeatedly and not commanded to lead and not commanded to rule is because we struggle with it. We need to hear it repeatedly. Because our sinful tendency will be to use selfishness as a reason to excuse our behaviour. Oh, sorry, to excuse our selfishness. We will use leadership to allow laziness. And we'll use headship to help ourselves. And so the call is to love. And then that love is defined. What kind of love is it? Not romantic love, not sentimental love, not slushiness. It is self-sacrificial, servant-hearted, humble love. Because it is love as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So at the very centre of that then is the gospel, right? This isn't simply an emotional or a physical response. This is a deliberate act of the will. Love here is a verb. It is in action. 1 John 4 verse 9 to 10, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And in the previous chapter, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So husbands who are called here to love, that's the love he's talking about. No overbearing all areas of married life are to be marked with self-sacrifice, self-giving love and forgiveness. Basically, husbands are commanded to put their wives first, to seek their wives' happiness over their own, and in doing so, to find that real joy. And to do that, we've got to listen to our wives, to understand our wives to know what her hopes are, what her fears are, what her joys are, what her sorrows are. Husbands are commanded to love because that defines the headship role. Love like this is servant-hearted. Love like this is for the good of the person receiving it. Look at how Paul then goes on to describe it even further. Husbands, love your wives, 25. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. Christ's love for the church has a beautiful purpose. That's why we read Ezekiel earlier. Because Christ's love for the church ends in glory. She is matchless in her beauty when you read Revelation, dressed in the finest clothes. Husbands, we aren't called to make our wives holy. That's, Jesus does that, right? He's the only one who can give that righteousness, that holiness. But the question is, are we helping that or hindering that? Are we pointing our wives to Jesus? Are we encouraging our wives with the word of God? Is our desire that our wives will be more like Christ? Or is our desire that our wives will be more like the models in the magazines? Are we investing time in our wives? Are we willing to ask ourselves a question like this? Is my wife more like Christ because she's married to me? Not because I'm great, but actually am I giving myself to her wholeheartedly in love so that she will become more like Jesus? To 
To lead like Jesus is to serve in love. So can you see how love and submission here actually end up being a, a beautiful dovetail together? Because we're both seeking to be like Jesus for each other. So the danger is that as men, we like reading this and going, great, we stop at the idea of being the head and think we've got it all sorted. But actually, to be the head means to give up what you want. To give up how you would rather things were done. To give up your own rights to love self-sacrificially, wholeheartedly, to death. And so men, we have to ask questions like this. Are we acting like teenagers? Are we glued to our phones, watching pornography, obsessed with computer games and addicted to our hobbies? Because if we are, we need to grow up and start serving. If you're single and you're a man and you can't lead yourself spiritually, you're not going to be able to lead in a marriage spiritually either. In verse 28 and 29, you might read and think, well, it feels like a bit of a come down. We've just been thinking about this glorious love of Christ in the gospel and now he talks about loving yourself. But the picture is all intertwined with the good news about Jesus, the command to love your neighbour, Jesus' own words in Matthew 7, to do unto others as he'd have them do to you, and the idea that man and woman together are united and become one flesh. And so this love of self and love of your wife as Christ loved the church kind of go hand in hand together. Picture Jesus caring for his own body, the church, nourishing and cherishing her, and then you get a picture of what he's talking about there. This is about tender love and care. And again, for men, see, our society values the macho, right? To be a man, you need to be macho. You need to be strong. You need to be into all these things. That's the way society speaks. And yet, the way scripture would speak about strength would be in gentleness and in humility and in tenderness. But the world thinks that's weakness and the Bible says it's strength. Are we doing that? Are we cultivating that and caring for lovingly and tenderly our wives? Paul then says, look, Christian marriage is a picture of the gospel. Verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Marriage then should, and again, we could have spent probably the whole sermon just thinking about this as an idea and, and a picture, that actually marriage should present to the world a beautiful picture of Christ and the church, or should point towards that relationship of Christ and the church. Our marriages are not going to be perfect. But they should point towards Christ and the church. And the instructions Paul has given here for husbands and wives will help us to do that and to do it well. Verse 33 then sits as a little bit of a summary. Husbands then are addressed first this time. Again, it's love. That was the third point of it, third time it's mentioned. Again, husbands love your wives. Drum that into your head. Husbands, love your wives and look at what that love is. Self-sacrifice, self-denial, selfless love. And wives, respect your husbands. We said from the start, but not explicitly, but we're going to say it explicitly now. These two things aren't conditional on each other. They're supposed to mesh together and go hand in hand. It's not that the husband only loves if his wife submits. It would be insane. The idea is that these two things produce, in God's economy, a picture of the gospel. Now, there's a lot more that could be said, but hopefully, Wednesday and house groups will be able to graciously talk through some of these things further together. But we should, in conclusion, hold a high view of marriage, because the Bible does. 
But as we hold a high view of marriage, we've got to make sure that in the way we talk about that, we talk positively then about singleness on the other hand. Because the Bible does. See, both marriage and singleness, again, Paul's words, are gifts from God. You've either got one or the other. And Paul actually says, look, my singleness has allowed me to serve the Lord in a way that wouldn't have been possible if I was married. And so that's a good thing. Not something to be wished away, but something to be used for God's glory. And marriage also shouldn't be presented. By holding marriage with a high view here, it shouldn't then be presented as the solution to people's problems. An ideal that every human being has to get married. Because that's just not the case. Marriage is good, God made it that way. But at one level, marriage is simply another relationship where love needs to be lived out. And in the marriage relationship... Because we are sinful people living in a sinful world, it will mean working through pain and suffering. It will mean trying and failing. It will mean needing to experience grace and forgiveness over and over again. Because marriage isn't all hearts and flowers, hugs and kisses, romance and fun, like Valentine's Day might suggest. We won't always feel in love but we're always called to love. And so husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And wives are called to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord. Which in very simple terms means both are called to self-sacrifice. Both are called to be like Jesus.